Good afternoon. Forgive me for speaking in English. My question today is based on the question of the conference. What kind of species are we? And I think we can tell what kind of species we are for the kind of future that we are creating and the kind of future that we are creating for the young people. The uh, Dutch futurist, Fred Polak, wrote, the rise and fall of images of the future precedes or accompanies the rise and fall of cultures. As long as a society's image is positive and flourishing, the flower of culture is in full bloom. Once the image begins to decay and lose its vitality, however, the culture does not long survive. In 1977, I was living in London. Some of you may remember a band called The Sex Pistols. The Sex Pistols had a song called God Save the Queen. And whether you like punk music or not, you have to admit there is a very poetic line in that song. There is no future in England's dreaming. I was 17. A little later, I left for the United States. But that's not strictly related. I think that line is, is poetic and important and perhaps even more important today because I think that we are in a situation where there is a sense that there is no future. I was just speaking to a wonderful young man and telling him about the importance of creating better futures and allowing young people to speak and to tell us what kind of futures they want. And like so many young people that I spoke to in the United States and in Europe, he said he had never thought about this. This wasn't a possibility that he had considered. And I'm not saying that's his fault at all. I think we've created a situation where all we know are dystopias. Dystopias have replaced utopias. The word progress that was still used when I was a young man has fallen out of favor. Nobody talks about progress anymore. We talk about nuclear disasters. We talk about environmental disasters, economic collapse. What is a better future? And what do young people have to look forward to? What kind of a species are we? Well, I think we might be able to tell from the kind of world that we leave behind. So what happened? If you look at these images, and I love to look at images of the future from our past, you see images of technological progress, of machines flying. We're still waiting for the jetpack to address our traffic problems. But what's missing from those futures? If you look at these pictures and so many other pictures of the future, you'll notice some things are missing. You'll notice, where's nature? There's no nature in any of these pictures. Um, you'll notice that mom is still making dinner with the help of wonderful machines, but, you know, that's still her role. And you'll notice in European images of the future, everybody's white. You'll notice in Chinese images of the future, everybody was Chinese. In Russian images of the future, everybody was Russian. There was no diversity. So I think our images of the future tell us about who we are and also tell us about some of the problems that we're facing. The Mayans were right. The world did end in 2012. Well, maybe not everything, but I think a certain kind of world did end. People have been talking about this transition for a long time, a post-industrial world, a post-modern world. 
my, uh, the, the Anthropocene, my new friend Colin Waters talked about the Anthropocene very eloquently. My uh, colleague Zia Sardar talks about a post-normal world. And I think all we have to do is look at the news and we will see that things are kind of post-normal. I think of it also as a post-progress world because it's not clear that there is any sense of things getting better. It's just a sense of how to avoid really, really bad things. And that's not enough. It's not enough to avoid bad things. There are any number of drivers of the current global transformation. One of them is the increasing complexity of our relationship to nature. Our relationship to nature is changing. We used to believe that the earth is huge, nature is huge, we can do whatever we want, we're there to take things, use them for our ends, and that's obviously not working anymore. The whole notion of the Anthropocene is based that we are now creating global transformation at an environmental level. And it also makes us think, what kind of species are we? We're not a species that's separate from nature. We are nature, too. There's the increasing complexity of the digital economy, of automation, of a global interconnected world. What it means to work is very different and increasingly will be different as more and more machines start doing what we used to do. The role of muscle will be relegated perhaps to the gym rather than the workplace. And this will require different kinds of education, different ways of thinking, different ways of understanding what it means to work, if, in fact, there will be that much work to do for us. There's increasing complexity because in an interconnected world, we live in a world with multiple perspectives. There used to be a time when we could live in a village and all we heard was different people in our village, in our town, talking, having different views on a subject. Now, we go on the internet or we go outside in the street and we can speak to people from different cultures, people with radically different perspectives to our own. And there's a much more international, heterogeneous world that we're living in. And that brings incredibly important changes, but also struggles, greater complexity. We have to be able to learn to understand each other and to get along better as well. There's increasing complexity in the roles of men and women. What does it mean to be a man? What does it mean to be a woman? In the old days, men defined themselves in opposition to women, women in opposition to men. I'm a boy to the extent that I don't do things that girls do. And girls were girls to the extent that they didn't do things that boys did. Now things are changing, where people are working, exploring. There's greater complexity. Women in the United States, certainly in Europe, are increasingly becoming the breadwinners. In the United States, they're certainly far more educated very often. This is creating real changes that we need to understand from a basic opposition, from a dualism, to a more complex world that we need to understand. We are, I think, at a point where we are experiencing what Edgar Morin calls a crisis of the future. It's also a crisis of identity. We don't have a future because, to some extent, we don't know who we are anymore. Are we part of nature? What, what, we don't really know what it all means. There's a lot of confusion. Um, Paul Gauguin asked these great questions in this beautiful painting. Where do we come from? What are we? Where are we going? Philosopher Immanuel Kant, what can I know? What, uh, what should I do? What can I hope for? And what can we hope for? I want to go back to this. What kind of species are we? Are we a species that leaves young people and, and even older people really nothing to hope for? Is that what our future is going to be about? I think 
we all agree that's not acceptable. We, we can't do that. One of the things that um, I think we've all had is the experience of going to the dentist. The dentist is a negative motivation. I go to the dentist because I want to avoid pain. I don't go, yeah, dentist. Well, maybe not. All these catastrophes that we're facing are negative motivations. And we need positive images of the future. We need something for us, and particularly for young people, to look forward to, for us to work towards. One of the things that also happens is if we live in a world where we only have dystopian images, if we only have dystopian images, that's all we can draw on and that's all we start believing is possible. That's all we start believing is possible. It's, this is called the availability heuristic. This is why I think it's important to start generating better visions of the future, to start bringing people together, and this is what we will do in the Center for Creative Futures, bring together people from all walks of lives, but particularly young people, to say, what would be a better future for you if you were to wake up five years from now, ten years from now, and the future is better, not perfect, not a utopia, what would that future look like for you? I hope it's not the case in Chile, but certainly in the United States, my students are very often afraid to talk about the future. They don't want to talk about the future. And this is heartbreaking. This is heartbreaking. So I think, at the same time, I tend to be an optimist. I believe that there are examples that we can draw on from the past and from the present, from the micro, from everyday interactions, everyday friendships, everyday acts of kindness, everyday acts of love, that show us what the world can be like and what the world is like. This all, we can also draw on examples from communities, from families, and larger cultural phenomena. There's the convivencia in Spain, which is a classic example of a cultural flourishing because of a, a diversity of traditions coming together. We can draw on these examples, but our tendency is always to focus on the negative. We must recognize the positive things in our everyday lives, and we must work to increase them. We can't let ourselves be too beaten down by the problems in the world. We have resources for the imagination. And one of the things that I, I want to point out is that when I was going to graduate school, there, um, there was no research on happiness and there was no research on love. A famous social psychologist got a grant to study love, and then she immediately got a prize from a U.S. senator for the biggest waste of money. Studying love, terrible waste of money. Because love was something for women's magazines, for novels. It's not something serious that we study, nor was happiness. We've seen things change with the emergence of positive psychology. People are now humanistic psychology. People are starting to begin to study and understand and talk about happiness. People are starting to research love and begin to understand it. And the research isn't the only important thing. The important thing is also that we are now talking about love more openly. We are not putting it in a little box and saying, this only belongs in the women's magazines or in the nice novels. This is what all human beings want. Human beings, in the end, we want to be happy. We want love. And at the same time, it's fascinating to see that until very recently, this wasn't even addressed in most 
scientific research. And, and the positive thing is, we are now beginning. Uh, Edgar Morin said, we live under a paradigm that lets us see certain things, but obscures other things. And we don't know what those things are. Well, we are now seeing that the old paradigm obscured things that are now coming to light. We are seeing the problems that our visions of the future created, but we are also starting to see the human resources, the possibilities for love, for empathy, another new area of study, and another term and experience that has become part of the dialogue now. We have to begin to envision these kinds of futures where we're not just focusing on the latest technological development. When we die, we don't want to say, I had the iPhone 10 before anybody else. I don't think that'll be sufficient. I think we will, t we will there will be things that we care about a lot more than that. And I want to leave you with a short story. In 1989, on the 8th of July, Chancellor Helmut Kohl of West Germany was in Poland. And he made a famous claim. He said, we expect the Berlin Wall will be there for another 20 or 30 years. The next day, it came down. I think sometimes when we look around us, we see the world, and it's easy to become despondent. It's easy to lose our faith in our ability to make changes. In our, we think things will be like this forever. They don't have to be. I think we can start paying attention to the reality of the possible. Because human beings, we have incredible possibilities, and very often we don't pay attention to them. We don't pay attention. The last speaker articulated these things beautifully. There is so much within us, and we haven't even been looking at it. And I think now, in this time of crisis, I think it's also a time of hope. It's a time where we can begin to create a future together. Thank you very much.